welcome to Boston or Somerville. Um, we are going to get started on time, and I just wanted to make the point that our goal in all of this is to not only present high-level talks, and I asked everybody, our, really our committee, asked everyone to put together talks that would be challenging the current trends, think about out-of-the-box ideas, out-of-the-box approaches to things, so that we really promote the idea of discussion among everybody. And so don't be afraid to ask questions, because uh, our goal here is to stimulate discussion and conversation that might lead to new ideas and new collaborations. So with that, I want to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Francois Haddad, who is a clinical professor of medicine at Stanford University Medical Center in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine. He specializes in the field of cardiovascular imaging, pulmonary vascular disease, advanced heart failure and transplantation, and he directs the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute Biomarker and Phenotypic Core Lab, and he focuses on identifying early markers of heart failure and aging and bioengineering approaches to disease modeling and novel informatic approaches. And his talk is entitled, Assessing the RV, It's All in the Curves. So, so thank you, Dr. Waxman. Thank you, Jane, for, for the invitation. And I have to say this is one of the best organized symposiums I've ever been invited to. And it's, it's amazing to be here. You like a title when somebody sends you the title of the talk and you start thinking and wonder, what is the talk about? What am I going to write about? And then we send it to the lab and everybody led people to think for several days to say, what's about the curves? So I'm going to tell you a little bit my journey about writing this talk. Okay, some disclosures, uh, some, some funding from Janssen, uh, funding from CardioSignal on seismocardiography, and we were part of the Project Baseline Health Study, uh, which with Duke and which was founded by Verily. Uh, so topic overview, what I wanted to review in this talk is really first I want to talk about the emerging concept about the cardiopulmonary venous unit. I think in our, and we're gonna review it together. The second part, the objective is to review the adaptation profile of, of the right ventricle and the right heart in pulmonary hypertension. And the last one is to discuss the intertwined feature of the right heart network when we look at imaging or hemodynamic and interrelationships. So I'll take you through a small journey that the topic and the title led me to go through that journey. So the first journey I wanna get you to is really discussing the anatomical curves. So that's the first curve that came to mind when they gave me the title. The second one was to follow that, follow the relationship between the anatomical curve to the physiology curve, and then lead from the physiology curves to the adaptation curves, and then finally discuss how this can be important when we assess the right heart and pulmonary hypertension. So this is the journey that I'll take you through, and I, I hope you like it. Uh, so the first thing, it's all about the curves. So which curves is the first ones? And the first curve that come to mind is really the anatomical curves. We often, to, to, in order to understand things, we like to divide them. We like to divide them into, into simplifying them. And for the heart, we like to divide it into the right, into the left heart. And that's our way of simplifying this. But does this make sense? So Dr. Bugbird, which uh, sadly passed away a few years ago, uh, he was one of the lead PI of the RESTORE trial. I really looked at all the anatomy of the heart. And just a few years before he died, he wrote a beautiful editorial called, What is the Heart? And he discusses really how we view the heart and how it doesn't make sense to view it necessarily as right or left or different perspective. And this is a beautiful, uh, beautiful picture from his review where he really looks at really the different parts, the different parts of the heart, re-emphasizing re the importance of the wrap of the heart and how really the right heart and the left heart are really intrinsically linked together uh, through the wrap. A little bit close up, this is the, the, the article review. I told you it's really worth reading is what is the heart? Uh, in 2018, and he really highlights in this review that Lauer already in, in, in 1600, 69, he really emphasized the fiber architecture of the heart. And really already in 1600s, he really looked at that. And it really looks like a, a Finobecki spiral and, and, and really beautiful numbers, golden ratios really when you look at that. And then Torin and Gasp really highlighted really the wrap of the heart and all, all the architecture of the heart. And in the review, what's really important is really looking at, at the wrap in the physiological way. We really have the helical wrap of the heart that really goes into the apex. And then we have really the wrap at the circumferential. 
In a lot of review, we always talk that there's a longitudinal fibers of the RV, but actually these longitudinal fibers of the RV really don't contribute much to the longitudinal shortening. It's really all contributed by the helical shortening of the apical wrap. And that's very important. It has a lot of consequences to the way we assess the ventricle. What is the consequences of that wrap and that helical feature of that first curve of the ventricle. The first rep is, initially people always said the right ventricle is forgotten, it's not important and we should disregard it. Why is that and why did we think of that? It started from early studies from Starr in 1943. So he did an experiment, which may be a little bit cr a really cruel experiment in a way, but he cauterized the whole right ventricle or part of the right ventricular free wall, including the atria. Uh, of animals, it was, it was done in dogs. So when he catheterized the heart, and he did that, he saw there was no changes really in hemodynamics, at least acutely in the heart. And that led a lot of people to think that the right ventricle is not important for the circulation. And that led to this thinking. But in reality, what's interesting is the left heart and the apex were left intact. So that spiral wrap that's really around the apex of the left ventricle was really leading to a contraction of the RV and contributing to the RV contraction. So that's, that's one of the reasons how the anatomy is really linked to the physiology of the right ventricle. Bugbird in beautiful studies continues, and these are three studies that are worth reading and highlighted to, to, to highlight really this wrap and its physiological consequences. So Bugbird did, did more isolation and tried to quantify, instead of talking about transverse and longitudinal, he really talks about circumferential and spiral influence of the heart. And he quantified what's the contribution to ejection and showing that the spiral component of the heart really is the one that contributes the most. So that's, that's one experiment. Damiaco, in another experiment, they isolated electrically the heart. So the left heart was isolated from the right ventricle. And in this study, through computational method, they quantified how much the left heart contributes to RV contraction. And that's where, where a lot of the numbers that, that, that we see when we say the right the left heart contributes to 30 to 40 percent, sometimes 60 percent in review comes from, is from this isolation of the heart. Another study that's really interesting that also highlights the ventricular interdependence, <clears throat> and a lot of studies from Dr. Tyberg that, that was also uh, at, at, at Brigham and Women and Harvard, uh, did then, then to Calgary, did a lot of the work, beautiful work they did, they showed that in pulmonary arterial hypertension, if you bend the aorta <clears throat> of the left heart, you really bend the aorta uh, in there, you really may decrease the fibrosis of the RV because you, you favor more, better interaction between the right heart and the left heart. So in this first part, I think of, this, of the talk, what I wanted to highlight is we divide to simplify between the RV and the LV, but the anatomy and the fiber architecture of the heart tell us it's an oversimplification and doesn't make much sense. It's really, it's really looking at it through a cardiac unit. So that's the first thing about the anatomy and physiology. The second part is I think we've evolved in our thinking looking at anatomy and physiology. In the second part, instead of looking just on the RV, I work with Anton von Nodegraff and Anna Hemes and a lot of other members, is how could we simplify looking at it? We start looking at the right RV, then we want to look at the, the RV, LV uh, as a unit, then we say, well, it's coupled to the lung, let's look at the cardio, cardiopulmonary unit because it's coupled to the lung. But right, right now, it's not only about the heart and the lung, but it's also its repercussion on the, on the system. So the venous success is important. So it's maybe more, more, more adequate to start talking more about the cardiopulmonary venous unit because venous congestion on, 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 on really on, on the liver, on the intestines, on the kidney is extremely important. And when we look at the curves, it's what are the curves that we're talking about? Physiology curves, there's a lot of curves we're talking about. When I look at the pulmonary flow circulation, an amazing work here from, from the lab of Dr. Waxman, Dr. Lewis, when we look at pulmonary circulation, it's all about pressure flow relationships. When we start looking at ventricular physiology, it's about pressure volume relationship that we want to highlight. And Anton really teaches us a lot when he talks about the RV physiology. And then when we want to look at, we could look at oxygenation, we focus on the FIC principle. When we look at metabolism, there's coronary flow physiology and substrate utilization. And when we look at molecular mechanisms, there's different spe specific molecular pathways that will look through PET. So what if, when we say it's all about the curves, it's about the anatomical curves, it's about all the physiology curve. And the person for the right heart physiology that highlighted much more that 
the pressure volume loop of the right ventricles, De Italia, he did really landmark work, not only in RV physiology in general and anal model, but also with my, our right ventricular myocardial infarction. And what he highlighted is really that the RV also follow, follows, you could describe it with ventricular elastance. And his study highlights it's not the end systolic ventricular elastance, it's really the maximal ventricular elastance for the right ventricle, what we often simplify by the end systolic elastance. And he also highlights the diastolic chamber stiffness. So that's about the pressure volume loops, that's very important. The third part of the curves, so the third curve to really remember is the adaptation curves. So the right heart really goes through different adaptation curves. And we often talk about adaptive remodeling, maladaptive remodeling, homeotropic remodeling, heterotropic remodeling, and I always found it very confusing because it's really a continuum. And apart from the congenital heart disease, we don't really find the homeotropic adaptation in very severe pulmonary hypertension. So the adaptive remodeling is really characterized by a hypertrophic, not dilated phenotype and with increased elastance and maintained ventricular arterial coupling versus a mallet that has cup or heterotropic remodeling is one where the right ventricle dilates early and there's ventricle arterial uncoupling. This looks great when we look at it at the extremes, but really, it's really a continuum. If we look at it in congenital heart disease and Eisenmenger physiology, it's true that we have a hypertrophic right ventricle that may not dilate, that could be adapted. In pulmonary arterial hypertension, the right heart remodeling occurs early in the process. It doesn't happen late. You start, start seeing a remodeling at the right ventricular apex, and then you have a volumetric remodeling of the right ventricle. So it's really a continuum. When we want to put this a little bit in the schematic that will modify and improve, is really the right ventricle, especially at the apex, starts remodeling very early in its curve of remodeling and adaptation. And then certainly the elastance is the arterial elastance, the first thing that changes, you know, uh, pressure, pr pressure cardiac output relationship with exercise will increase very early. RV will start to increase and dilate and, re and remodel in pH and chronic pH and coupling starts going down with changes in metrics of exercise that happen earlier. So what is the consequence when we do echo or imaging of the heart? If we start with the physiology of the heart. So I always start to say, what is the phenotype we're looking at? Are we looking at a dilated phenotype or we're we looking at a non-dilated, like in heart failure with preserves ejection fraction? If we're looking at a dilated phenotype, like we have in PAH or we have in dilated cardiomyopathy in the left heart, there's going to be a strong network of connection. First, mathematically, because you dilate the, the heart and the stroke volume, if it's well compensated, will be maintained. Necessarily, your fractional change metric, EF, strain, transverse shorting will necessarily be uh, go down, be lowered also. It's going to be necessarily interconnected. By physiology, wall tension will increase, and O2 demands will increase, and anti pro BMP will increase. So it's necessarily going to be interrelated. And at advanced stage, annular dilatation will happen, and TR will happen. And there's going to be ventricular interaction when there's going to be LV, LV that will, will, will become uh, smaller also. So this the pattern of dilated phenotype or, or, or the adaptation curve of the RV necessarily links all the metrics together. We looked at that uh, in chess looking, just trying to make sense of all these metrics and when we focus on our favorite metric, but when you look at it, they're all interrelated through a strong network. This here shows what if you put all the network together, the NT pro BNP, because it's connected to volume, connected to pressure, will often be central in the network, but also highlights that a lot of the metric are really strongly related together, uh, together in, in pH. It's not a bad news. It's actually a good news because it enables us to do feature reduction. We don't need all the metric to really reach a conclusion. But if something's very related, it could be a very good news in a lot of ways. And when we try to look at it, this is a little bit with Anton and, and the task force, we're just putting some criteria for physiology. When you want to assess a metric, what do you want to do? What's the checklist when you want to assess the metric? And this is my personal checklist, is a metric has to have a strong physiological basis. You have to look whether it has good analytical variability whether it has individuality of the metric, whether it has a good dynamic range in the disease, whether it follows a trajectory between the quantitative stage of disease. You don't want something to pseudo-normalize. Like the tie index pseudo-normalizes. You don't like a metric that pseudo-normalizes. You don't want an IVRT that could pseudo-normalize with disease. You want something that is valuable. You want something that's not too expensive and something that's safe for the patient. 
When we said about that adaptation curves, how it's important, you look at this is a beautiful review by Alabet and Jack Imaging 2021. It shows this is non-scaled hazard ratios. Every metric is one unit, but it shows that almost all the metric of the RV are predictive. And it's not surprising. surprising. We have a dilated phenotype, so all metric will be very closely linked together in a lot of ways. And my, my two cents of looking at this is let's not focus on the metric we prefer, let's focus on the complementary parity between the metric and choose the one that is the most reproducible in, in the lab that you want. If you, you one, one combination could be RV and systolic volume, RA pressure, and T-probe BNP if we want to choose three simple metrics. Other combinations could, could involve the RA and other ones could involve the RV strain. But they're going to be complementary and that's the key is to find complementary metrics. This is a study from the MRI cohort of SWIFT, where he highlights in their study where they looked at different coupling metric based on MRI and volume, stroke volume of RV. What came out is the RV and systolic volume that could not pseudo-normalize even when you have TR at late stage. So that's the metric that came out strongly. This is a nice study from Ryu. Again, these are selected study. Monica will present much more in-depth uh, analysis that follow. Rio, Rio really also did a beautiful study uh, from Pittsburgh where they did a 3D echo, echo in 2015 when they published where they did area strain and did end systolic volume strain. Using that, they defined really different adaptation curves of the ventricle. And in that study, uh, volume was a little bit stronger than, than area strain in that study. But again, they were close because they're interrelated in the disease. Shifting from the physiology curves, there's another curve that are very important is the shape. We cannot forget there again, they're interrelated by the shape. So what did the, the, the deep learning studies, we always highlight in these days a lot about deep learning, but what did deep learning studies really teach or the hotspot on saliency maps from, from beautiful studies, again, from Swift and MRI? What, where, where's the saliency spots? They really, they, 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 target, they target the septum, they target the apex, they target the shape of the left ventricle. So a lot of it has to do with shape changes and the curve of the RV chase, cha changes. Amsalan tried looked at that with echo, where we tried to quantify different shape of the ventricle and different ways uh, to quantify where she saw that shape is also predictive, but it's not different than volume or, or strain. It's, it's just a different way to integrate it. <laughs> Moving from the last two, two sli three slides, there's other things. It's not just about the RV, but pulmonary flow is important. Mm -hmm. These two studies are very interesting about pulmonary flow, where Beck Hansen really, in, in circulation imaging in 2010, reviews how the wave reflection really subtracts when we do flow, but it adds when we do pressure. And, and it really shows really an analysis of pulmonary flow that's really, really nicely done. And, and the group from Mayo really showed that you could redivide profile of pulmonary flow profile to characterize disease really well. So this is really to look that it's not just about the RV, there's also the, pul the pulmonary flow curves. And, and it's not just about the RV or the pulmonary circulation. A lot of work from, from Andre, uh, Andre Deneau in Montreal with any, many other groups, they really favor venous excess imaging on how to look at it really both with, with, with the diastolic curves and the pulmonary curves, and also how to look at hepatic vein flow, portal vein flow, intrarenal flow when you assess a patient with pH. And that is extremely important when we assess. It's, it's actually very interesting. Some, some patients that have really high RA pressure really have preserved portal vein flow, even though their pressures are 20 and consistently 20. They stay preserved and, and they don't have phasic flow and others are very susceptible. I always remember a patient in the ICU where we had post-transplant had really severe RV failure. And every time we assess the liver, they had pulmonary flow and they, 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 they didn't have urinary output. And when they got dialyzed in a few days, the hepatic vein flow improved, the renal flow profile improved and they started diuresing a lot. So it's, this is very important. So to summarize, last, last slide. So what, what is, it's all about the curve, Jane. Thank you for, for, the title, for the topic. So the first curve is the anatomical curves and the spiral curve of the apex is very important because that's what drives the apical annular motion of the RV that's so important. That's the first talk. The second thing, it's not just about the right heart, it's about the cardiac unit. It's about the pulmonary circulation. It's about the venous unit. And with Anton, you want to highlight that uh, it's probably about the cardiopulmonary venous unit. That's what's really important. The last part is there's adaptation curves of the right heart, 
the right heart adaptation profile is really a dilated adaptation profile. The consequence of that is all the metrics are linked together as an adaptation profile. And it's important to find complementarity and choose the metric in your lab that's the most reproducible. And the last thing, the, the, la the last thing is really not for granted is thanking. I want to thank Jane, uh, Dr. Waxman, and uh, nothing happens without a great team from, uh, from, the, from Stanford, from, from Paris that I work a lot with, and mentors, also in exercise physiology I really enjoy working with. Uh, so I want to thank you. We're going to hold questions till at the end of the session, so come up here and then we'll be able to have a panel discussion. So. Okay, and next it is my pleasure to introduce Monica Mukherjee. She's an associate professor at Johns Hopkins, director of the Echo Lab at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center, and associate director of all the Johns Hopkins Echo programs across institutions. She is a world-renowned leader in advanced imaging modalities for RV remodeling. Her work has won numerous awards, and we're thrilled that she's here to talk to us about assessing the RV. It's in the dots, not the curves. Focus on speckle tracking and strain imaging. So I won't make you choose between dots and curves. I hope that this is a complimentary uh, discussion to to um, add to what Francois just presented. So thank you to um, Drs. Leopold and Waxman for the invitation. I do not have any relevant disclosures. The objectives of my talk today will be to discuss the echocardiographic assessment of the right heart, chamber size, and function. We will talk about special considerations in pulmonary vascular disease, and then establish the role for the DOTS, the speckle tracking echo, to detect abnormalities in RV function and contractile reserve. So as an introduction, the RV has always historically lagged behind that, uh, the assessment of the LV, at least by echo. And the first guidelines came out for the right heart back in 2009. And I'm really excited to say that this year we will be publishing an update um, on the right heart guidelines from, um, from the American Society of Echo. And it's important to remember that in normal subjects, the RV adopts this thin, compact, uh, heavily trabeculated uh, cavity. It's crescentric in normal patients with a very triangular base. By 2D echo, you really cannot see the RV outflow track. So when you're assessing function using echo, typically you're ignoring the RV outflow track contributions, which is something that um, MRI is able to do. Um, and you can see here that the major vector of contraction is along a longitudinal plane. So when we're looking at echo from the apical forward chamber view, we really should be making all measurements from an RV focus view. So you take the conventional apical forward chamber where the probe is at the apex of the heart and you move it laterally so you can see the entire RV free wall throughout the cardiac cycle. You should not be able to see the opening of the LVOT or the coronary sinus. So it's just a, a slight adjustment. And this is important because using echo, we can comprehensively assess at bedside in real time what the RV is doing. And that starts with a morphologic assessment. So you can do 2D guided um, linear measurements from the apical four chamber. This is looking at the base, which is the um, distance in end diastole of that tricuspid annulus right below the annular plane. The mid ventricle, which is very important, um, and we'll mention why that's important in a moment. That's really at the level of the papillary muscles, the middle third of RV inflow and then the longitudinal dimension. Now, one thing that the last guidelines did not um, address, which we will address in the updated guidelines, is that that longitudinal dimension should be parallel to the intraventricular septum. So as your septum shifts, that measurement should shift as well, and it should um, be perpendicular to uh, the annular plane. We also can use echo to look at wall thickness from the subcostal view. This is something that's frequently um, underestimated and not even commented at all. Um, we can also look at the RVOT from the parasternal long axis view, uh, the short axis view at the level of the aortic valve and the distal. Um, now, the reference values have been a hot topic in the echo world. There's a lot of new uh, studies coming out of various populations about how every single one of these needs to be indexed. Um, and we will address that as well in the, um, 
in the uh, updated guidelines, it's important to remember that there are sex specific and racial and ethnic implications of what normal is. So some of the studies out of the Waze um, trial, for example, have shown that Asian women in general, as they age, tend to have a smaller RV. So what we are calling abnormal may not be abnormal in every single population. Now, when you're looking at the right atrium, this is also taken from the apical four-chamber modified focus view, also remembering that the atria and the ventricle are on slightly different planes. So you really have to open up the entire roof of the RA. That's a frequent source of undermeasurement. The reference values for abnormal are an area of greater than 18. And why is it important that we even look at the RA? If you see a big RA, this is a chronic elevation in your RV filling pressures. The RA does not dilate acutely. You can also see a dilated RA in patients that have normal RV filling pressures, but this is a sign um, in a non-athlete or in a non-young person of someone who has chronic elevation in your RV filling pressures and RV diastolic dysfunction. We can also look at phasic function of the right atrium using speckle tracking. So the atrium and the ventricle have a dynamic interplay where the RA function highly um, affects RV performance throughout the cardiac cycle. So it modulates RV filling and cardiovascular performance in a similar way as the LA and the LV. So first, the RA serves as a reservoir for systemic venous return during ventricular systole, and it's governed by atrial compliance and relaxation. It serves as a conduit for venous return during early ventricular diastole, and lastly, as a booster pump. So um, I would recommend that, you know, for those of you who read um, echo, echoes in the cardiology world and even, you know, for our pulmonology colleagues who are doing this at bedside, really look at the RA and comment, is it big or is it small? Because that gives you a lot of important information. You should also be looking at the interventricular septal morphology. So this is called the eccentricity index. This is the ratio of the length of two perpendicular dimensions from the perishinal short axis view taken at the level of the papillary muscles. And really, in normal pressure uh, volume states, the LV should be able to maintain a roughly circular contour throughout the cardiac cycle. And if the septum is flat in diastole, it's a predominant volume problem. If it's flat throughout the cardiac cycle, it's a pressure volume problem. Using echo, we can also do a functional assessment. So most of the functional assessments that we do measure that longitudinal motion. So we do that in two major ways. That's TAPSI, which is the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. That's measuring the motion of the base to apex as a marker of RV function. We can also look at how fast is that annular segment moving. That's tissue Doppler S prime velocity. We can also uh, measure what's known as fractional area change, which is simply the area change in end diastole and end systole as a calculation of RVEF that roughly correlates with RVEF by CMR. And then as Francois mentioned, we can also look at RV stroke volume. So you're looking at how fast velocity is crossing the pulmonic uh, valve as a measure of stroke volume and the equation is there. And here are all the normal values. Um, and then, of course, it's great if we have 3D echo, but oftentimes it's not practical at the bedside. Um, but 3D echo um, correlates very strongly with um, RVEF by CMR. So as Francois mentioned, um, the RV functions as an N organ mechanistically in animal models. So as there's an increase in afterload, the initial adaptive response of the RV is actually to hypertrophy through means of sarcomerogenesis. So in early um, pulmonary vascular disease, the only sign that you may see is, an, is a normal RV size, but increased wall thickness. But then when progressive increase in RV afterload, the contractile increases are insufficient to maintain cardiac output, and the uh, RV chamber will begin to dilate. One of the very first things that you will see is an increase in the RV chamber radius, that mid-ventricular segment that we talked about. It will dilate before the base dilates. Um, the other thing that you can see is what's known as apical traction. So the RV wall is unable to counteract the forces of the LV, and the apex will start to be 
kind of tethered leftwards. Now, in all of these scenarios, all of those longitudinal measures, TAPC, tissue Doppler, S prime, they're only looking at that basal segment and what the basal segment is doing. So they will overestimate the function of the RV. If you see panel B, something bad is happening. If you see panel C, where there's complete uncoupling of the RV to the PA, the bad thing has already happening and it's still going on, right? So we need to be jumping on patients in panel B very, very early. Um, panel C shows that there's spherical of the RV chamber, the RA is dilated, you see bowing of the uh, atrial septum as well, um, and there's the spherical of the RV. This means that the RV is failing um, based off of um, the RV afterload. And this is a real-time example. So here we see a small deremodeled LV, abnormal eccentricity index, huge RV that's hypertrophy. There's apical tethering. This patient had a normal TAPSI. So all of these measures we have to take in context of what the morphologic structure of the heart is. Um, and then here example is, here's another example of panel B that we talked about, that early change where there's an increase in the chamber radius and you can see that there's apical tethering. These patients all will have normal basal function. So really pay attention to morphology and function together. Now other important considerations in pH is again, I mentioned kind of changing your linear measurements, looking at the eccentricity index, looking at fractional area change if apical traction is present. And then lastly, you can also look at the behavior and the Doppler contour of your RV outflow signal. So in pH, this will become increasingly um, short. It will peak in early systole um, versus the normal parabolic shape that you will see as the RV gently um, ejects into the compliant pulmonary vasculature. You can also use echo to determine pre versus post capillary phenotypes. So the right predominant phenotype is a phenotype where the RV is hypertrophied, there's a big RA, there's a small LV, the PA may be dilated, you'll have an abnormal eccentricity index, um, and then dilated IVC and hepatic veins versus a left phenotype, so a post-capillary phenotype where there's pathologic MR, uh, usually there's um, pathologic elevation in your E over E prime, um, and the LA is dilated. So if you see LA dilatation as well, as well as hypertrophy and a lot of MR or AS, you really want to think that the elevation in your uh, PA pressures may have a left component. Now, when we talk about deformation imaging, a lot of people find speckle tracking to be scary and they don't know what it is. But when we look at an echo, it is comprised of thousands upon thousands of pixels. And so we can actually isolate those pixels and measure the displacement and velocity of each of those pixels throughout a cardiac cycle. And then there's different spatial components along an X, Y, and Z direction or the anatomic components of longitudinal, radial, and circumferential. So when we're measuring this, all we have done with RV strain is that we've actually taken what we do on the left and we're doing it on the right. So this is an example of LV strain that I'll just go through with you. So by, as the ultrasound beam is hitting the myocardium, it's generating thousands and thousands of pixels or speckles through random refraction scattering um, of the ultrasound beam. And then we're using offline software to track those changes throughout the cardiac cycle. So here we see the onset of the QRS. You'll see a less negative strain that peaks at um, aortic valve closure. So that's the most negative strain. That means that it's it's very contractile. Then the onset of diastole and isovolumetric relaxation, and then your peak diastolic relaxation velocity. And we can you know, apply these same techniques to the RV. A normal RV free wall strain value is around 25, negative 25. So we're all very familiar with the World Symposium classification of pH, and I want to now show you how strain can be used to distinguish the different pH subtypes. So RV strain predicts mortality in stable HFREF patients independent of any other clinical measure. Now, um, there's two things that... Um, are important. So there's global strain and then there's free wall strain. And those terms are sometimes used interchangeably, but always read the methods. Global strain refers to inclusion of the intraventricular septum. 
versus free wall strain is just the contribution of the RV. And what we see in HEFBREF is that patients become increasingly reliant on the intraventricular septum. So this study showed that both uh, correlated with RV and LV systolic function, but the uh, correlation with LV systolic function obviously was stronger for uh, global strain. You can also use RV strain in HEFPEF. So this is a very heterogeneous disease. We're seeing it more commonly. Um, it's associated with more severe pH, AFib, CAD, and higher BMIs, and a poor prognosis. And RV strain can track subclinical RV dysfunction better than conventional measures. We can also look at RV strain to distinguish between a primary pressure versus volume overload. So this was a study of 45 PAH versus CTEF patients who were the pressure overload uh, cohort versus 44 patients with an ASD, so uh, group two disease. The RV size was larger in the volume group and then all of the other measures were lower in the pressure group. Um, and RV global strain and free wall strain could accurately discriminate RV pressure from volume overload, more so than any of the conventional measures that we have using a cutoff of negative 16. So here you can see that diminished free wall strain in PAH is associated with worse functional uh, class, shorter six minute walk, higher, um, Six minute walk, uh, that's actually wrong. So a uh, shorter six minute uh, walk distance, RV failure and predicted outcomes as well. And RV strain was predictive of a higher risk of death. Um, in this other study, ADPH patients, a variable etiology strain actually was predictive of um, four year survival. So we should be performing strain on all of these patients um, routinely in our clinical practice. Now, I want to just spend a few moments focusing on systemic sclerosis because systemic sclerosis is very relevant in pulmonary vascular disease because it can, it can cause group 1, 2, and 3 pulmonary hypertension. Um, it's a complex heterogeneous autoimmune disease where there's widespread variable fibrosis of multiple organ systems. There's two main subtypes, limited and diffuse, and cardiac involvement is quite common. And it is our center's practice to perform echocardiograms on these patients every single year to um, evaluate for potential cardiac and um, pulmonary hypertension. So I looked at RV strain in systemic sclerosis patients, and we found something really interesting. We found that in systemic sclerosis pre-PH patients, that the base of their heart was, heart was hypercontractile. It was so hypercontractile um, despite controlling for pulmonary pressures with normal conventional measures. So there's something bad that's happening in their heart early that we were only able to see using RV strain. We then looked at patients with overt PAH, and we found that the patients who developed RV failure were the ones who lost the basal hypercontractility. So at similar loading conditions, global strain was worse in systemic sclerosis PAH versus IPH at the same pulmonary pressures because they lost that ability of the base to contract. We then followed um, the um, improvement of basal strain with upfront combination therapy with Tadalafel and Ambersentin and found that the behavior and the response of the base per was predictive of outcome. You can also look at RV reserve with strain. So this was another study where we looked to see what strain did when you exercise these patients. So again, all pre-PH patients. And what we found is when you exercise scleroderma patients, the base of their heart can't augment anymore. It's already working the hardest that it is at rest. When you exercise them, their cavity dilates. So scleroderma patients who are in that pre-PH, mildly elevated uh, subtype, are able to maintain cardiac output by dilating their chamber. So, um, and that RV reserve by a non-invasive test was predictive of overt pH at five years. RV strain has also been looked at in CTEF. So here's an example of an acute PE. You can look at the RV-LV ratio where TAPSI is predictive. Um, here you can see that classic McConnell sign where there's bowing of that mid-ventricular segment and hypercontractility of the base. Um, and in this uh, study, you can actually see that apical strain is what is reduced in acute PE. 
even if they do not have McConnell sign. So McConnell sign is only positive some of the times. You can also see McConnell sign in patients that have chronic elevation in their pulmonary pressure. It's that internal chamber radius and the bowing of that internal chamber that you're seeing. When you look at RV strain in CTEF, these patients actually have diminished strain in the basal and midventricular segments, um, and that's actually predictive as well. So there's different patterns of strain that we see across the P, uh, pH classes as well. So again, this is very prognostic and an important tool that we should be using. So in conclusion, when assessing RV function quantitatively, it's important to integrate structure and function and not take one thing in isolation. Conventional measures may overestimate RV function, and RV strain is a technically feasible tool. It's readily available. You can measure global and regional RV function, and it's less influenced by loading conditions. It's prognostic, it's predictive, and it's important. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Great talk. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Paul Yu, who I think actually now reflects the true MGB philosophy, having bounced back and forth between the Brigham and the General uh, a couple times now. Paul is uh, the director of the Cardiovascular Research Center at Mass General and an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And his laboratory has focused on novel models, molecular tools, and pharmacologic probes with, and I think it very relevant to where the, the field is heading, uh, focusing on born morphogenetic proteins, activins, growth differentiating factors, and TGF-beta, essentially laying some of the groundwork for sotatercept and the whole new realm of treatment. He's also done a lot of work on novel imaging approaches and has looked at the potential of PET imaging uh, to both detect and monitor disease changes. Uh, so today he's going to provide a talk on is there a role for PET or molecular imaging to assess the right ventricle. Thanks so much for having me and uh, for, for this opportunity to tell you about some of our um, uh, collective experience in applying PET imaging to assess RV function and uh, RV metabolism. These are some of my disclosures. Okay, and I'm gonna to talk today about PET imaging, uh, just a, a brief overview of some of the isotopes and probes that are used, uh, the concept of dynamic versus static scanning, and then some of the biologic processes that we can capture with PET imaging that may be relevant to RV remodeling, including metabolism, inflammation, proliferation, fibrosis, uh, and, and other aspects. Um, and how these modalities might be used to predict outcomes, assess the efficacy of our current treatments and novel treatments, and also to understand mechanisms of RV compensation, as our other speakers have introduced. So there are a couple of advantages of PET-based imaging modalities for pulmonary hypertension or RV imaging. Uh, there's a high sensitivity and signal-to-noise ratio for low abundance signals, um, there's the capability to assess direct molecular um, uh, signals as well as metabolic signals. And there's a capacity to be highly quantitative. This happens using a variety of techniques. One is dynamic imaging, where you look at the actual real-time uptake of your probes into tissues. And there are probes that are both uh, therapeutic agents and diagnostic agents. They're agnostic probes. Uh, so in one scan, you can get a good sense of pharmacodynamics and the availability of your target. Um, but there are some disadvantages. Even though PET imaging has come a long way, the spatial imaging is limited compared to some of the techniques that our other speakers have introduced. It's, it's just less crisp. Um, there is exposure to ionizing radiation. These are frequently coupled with uh, a low-dose CT scan for co-registration. Uh, what that means for your patients is about one to five millisieverts per study for something like FDG PET, in addition to a similar number of millisieverts for your low-dose CT. Um, some of these techniques are commercially available as probes, but sometimes you'll need uh, on-site cyclotrons in a nuclear pharmacy to isolate very short-lived or non-commercially available probes. And the probe half-life dictates the timing of your scan. So these are not things that you can do spontaneously 
uh, on a whim in your Friday afternoon clinic. This is something that usually takes some mobilization. Okay, so what are the isotopes that we use? Um, you'll hear a lot today about the use of uh, 18 fluoride. 18 fluorine uh, is a beta emitter. It's a short half-life. It's really ideal for some of these applications for really uh, rapid acquisition and dynamic scanning. Um, but you'll see in other uh, applications, people use higher energy emitters like 68 gallium and uh, very high energy 89 zirconium. These are helpful for labeling small molecules as well as proteins, whereas uh, F18 is often used uh, as a metabolic probe. Uh, given the availability of chemistry uh, to label a lot of uh, metabolites. Okay, so a lot of you are familiar with these seminal studies um, that introduced the concept of metabolic imaging uh, to group 1 pH and to the RV. Uh, this off cited paper from Okawa and colleagues in Sendai, Japan on the left showed this very pretty picture of really increased uptake in the RV in patients with pH that seem to be proportional to the severity of PAH. Um, and on the right, this uh, paper from Leipzig, from Kluge and colleagues showed uh, a very similar result. Uh, they added the refinement of using dynamic scans to look at the real-time uptake of glucose in the RV tissues. And both of these groups showed very nicely that the uptake measured either using static SUV uptakes or standardized uptake values or dynamically acquired um, uh, myocardial glucose uptake, or MGU, were both very uh, correlated with a number of hemodynamic parameters. And in addition, uh, also um, predicted uh, anti-proBNP values. Okay, so these uh, uptake values correlated with invasive hemodynamics, but uh, appeared to, as far as we knew then, reflect either altered metabolism, or potentially increased tissue mass, or potentially inflammation. You, you can't really resolve those. The study from Columbia showed subsequently that the RV to LV SUV ratios were highly correlated again with hemodynamics, um, but this is a refinement. Uh, specifically looking at the ratio of activity in the RV in relation to the LV provides a built-in quantitative control, and you, you get an even nicer prediction of hemodynamics using this method. Uh, this was done side by side with ammonia per, uh, perfusion imaging, which just shows you blood flow. And I would note a few interesting things about this study, which was that uh, the perfusion scanning did nothing to predict hemodynamics. Um, it was not increased in relation to the RV mass that was increased in these patients. And so there is this disconnect, I think that's quite important, between these two PET parameters where one reflects increased metab uh, glucose metabolism mass of the RV, the FDG PET, and what is probably an inadequate supply of perfusion uh, in relation to the mass via the perfusion imaging. So I think um, these, these um, all together are consistent with this concept of uh, chronic ischemia due to supply dis demand mismatch in the RV. And uh, this study also established that this RV to LV ratio uh, is a very reproducible uh, PET parameter for scoring the RV that you'll see in a couple of other studies. So this is a model of the vicious cycle of RV failure taken from a review article from Steve Archer and colleagues, uh, but other, other people have advanced this idea and people in this room have found a lot of evidence from your patients and from preclinical models that uh, many of these things appear to be contributing. Uh, but I think that what you'll see is that FTG PET, by looking at glucose uptake, captures a couple of different aspects of the cycle. It captures nicely the increased mass of uh, the hypertrophied RV. It captures the metabolic shift to glucose metabolism. And it also seems to capture, when coupled with perfusion imaging, the relative ischemia. So back to this RV uh, to LV ratio. So uh, other groups have subsequently shown uh, that this ratio not only predicts hemodynamics, but also corresponds closely with echocardiographic measures of RV performance, such as RV strain and TAPSI, in addition to nt pro bnp So a lot of groups have shown this now. Um, so given that RV function and T-proBNP are highly predictive of survival, it shouldn't be surprising then that RV uptake of glucose by PET is also predictive of survival, as several people have shown. 
um, the, the same group from Sendai Japan showed on the left here, that simply using a modified standardized uptake value in the RV is predictive of event-free survival. And then the uh, Kaminsky lab in Poland on the right showed that if you took that nice RV to LV ratio and coupled that with RV ejection fraction, you could predict very nicely uh, event-free survival over several years. So if you remember one thing from this talk today, remember that there's this cutoff of one between the RV and the LV uptake of glucose that is a marker of severe RV metabolic dysfunction. And it makes sense because in, in your normal physiologic state, they should not have the same energetics. Okay, so there's this elegantly studied, uh, elegantly designed study from Wang and colleagues from Peking Union Medical College, which showed that dynamic FTG PET was not only predictive of hemodynamics and echo in these 27 incident PAH patients, as you might expect, uh, but that the direction of change in the RV myocardial glucose uptake after six months of therapy was highly predictive of changes in functional capacity uh, measured by six-minute walk distance, RV ejection fraction, and other RV performance metrics. And this suggests that conventional vasodilator therapy can help normalize the metabolic dysfunction or energetics of the right ventricle that's failing. Uh, this study, uh, which is a collaboration between Peking and uh, um, uh, um, Imperial College of London between Wei Fang and Lanzhou, examined the performance of FTG PET ratios in the RV versus LV and IPH versus congenital heart disease, um, speculating that these, um, this measure might perform differently in different etiologies of PAH. And these cohorts, importantly, were well-matched in terms of severity based on hemodynamics and functional capacity. As previously shown in other group one cohorts, the FTG RV to LV ratio was predictive of PVR and other hemodynamic measures in both IPH and CHD, but it was a little less robust in CHD uh, for reasons um, that I, I'm gonna show you. Um, there, there was a bit more heterogeneity in the congen congenital heart disease associated pH population uh, when looking at any of the hemodynamics, suggesting that um, the physiologic meaning of this ratio is a bit different in congenital heart disease than in idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. And consequently, when they looked at the ability to predict survival, this FTG uh, RV to LV ratio was highly predictive of survival in IPH, but not so much in congenital heart disease. Okay, back to the concept of uh, imaging as a way to probe metabolism. So this is a schematic, again, from Steve Archer's lab, um, who've done a lot to validate these concepts preclinically. Uh, and it shows the decreased metabolic efficiency of the failing and ischemic RV, where increased glycolysis is found in addition with, in association with reduced glucose oxidation. And this, in turn, may be suppressed by fatty acid oxidation, which is the normal uh, preferred energy utilization pathway of the myocardium. But this fatty acid oxidation uh, metabolism can suppress pyruvate dehydrogenase, or PDH, which then would otherwise permit entry of pyruvate from glycolysis into the TCA cycle in the mitochondria. Okay. So the, the question then is, can uh, PET imaging uh, reveal some insights about this imbalance and about attempts to correct this imbalance? So O'Hara and colleagues asked if PET scanning with three different modalities, including ammonia for perfusion on top, FDG for glucose metabolism, and the labeled long-chain fatty acid, thioheptadecanoic acid, or FTHA, could probe um, these different energy utilization substrates in the RV. And as you would expect, FTG PET robustly predicted hemodynamics in this group, one PAH cohort shown right here. Um, when they looked at hemodynamics for FTHA alone, there was really no correlation with severity based on any of the measures that they looked at. And in fact, when you tried to combine these metrics using a ratio, there was no added information here. So, Qualitatively, there is a difference between the fatty acid uptake in the failing RV versus glucose. It is not seeming to be proportional to, um, to, to hemodynamics. And in fact, it's pretty consistent across the range of uh, severity of PAH. Um, so in revisiting this model, it would seem like uh, fatty acid oxidation 
may be disproportionate to glucose oxidation, but not in an absolute sense that we could capture on these scans. Uh, but we can still use PET to tra uh, track interventions that target this balance. This uh, balance is also known as uh, Randall cycle, the balance between fatty acid oxidation and glucose oxidation. And specifically, we can look at one intervention that we use, pre uh, use clinically for uh, ischemic heart disease for chronic angina, and that's renolazine, which is an inhibitor of the myocardial uh, voltage-gated sodium channel that is also thought to inhibit fatty acid oxidation. And uh, if, if this hypothesis were correct, it might change glucose utilization in the RV. So, so what happens? So this is a, a very elegant study from um, Yuchi Han at UPenn, uh, who's now at Ohio State University, and Aaron Waxman's group, looking at uh, six months of intervention with ronolazine in a population with stable precapillary pulmonary hypertension and reduced RV ejection fractions of less than 45%. So um, ronolazine was an add-on therapy to the stable population. And what they saw in sequential CT scans, PET CT scans after six months, is that there is relatively decreased glucose uptake in the RV, shown here in these scans, compared to the placebo-controlled group. And this actually was quantitative. This, this study, which was um, really nicely executed, combined two state-of-the-art techniques, used cardiac MRI to look at RV performance measures, along with FTG PET. And what, what shook out from all this is that um, treatment was associated with uh, significant gains in RV ejection fraction, in RV and LV stroke volume, and in decreases in that really helpful RV to LV FDG uptake ratio. Okay, so in case you were wondering, uh, let me let me go back here. So what is that? What is the direction of the change? It's remember 1.0 is that cutoff for severe. Uh, dysfunction, and this was a direction change of minus 0.17. That was significant. So in case you're wondering how this compares to uh, approved therapies, um, this study from Poland actually looked at the um, therapeutic escalation of pulmonary hypertension in, in patients uh, and the impact on um, changes in that RV to LV ratio, as well as predictive um, the ability of that ratio to predict survival. And I think the most interesting thing about this study was that the reduction in that ratio was 0 0.2 over a 24-month 20 peri period with the escalation of therapy. So very comparable to what we saw with renolazine in six months. And then the other really interesting thing that came from this was that I told you about this ratio of one. That ratio of one was predictive of event-free survival after 24 months. But they added a little bit more granularity and made an even lower cutoff of 0 0.54. This is still abnormal, and this predicts events at 48 months. So along the same lines of metabolic changes that are adaptive and maladaptive, low risk and high risk, the study from Serpil Erzurum's um, lab in Cleveland Clinic examined how FTG PET <clears throat> might uh, relate to circulating metabolites with the hypothesis that if we're detecting altered metabolism in the RV, is this evident in the circulation? And uh, like many other studies, they showed that you could segregate uh, PAH into high-risk and low-risk groups by that ratio of RV to LV greater than or equal to one versus less than one. And you can see that almost every metric they looked at segregated nicely, whether that was functional, hemodynamic, um, or RV imaging-based. But what they also looked at uh, was the correlation of the metabolic profile uh, in these patients with high RV-LV ratios and saw that there was an exaggeration of fructose catabolism, arginine nitric oxide metabolism, and increased Krebs cycle and ketone body metabolism, all of which might be predicted uh, by what we understand about Randall cycle and the energetics of the RV. Okay, so, so far we've talked about PET imaging of RV glucose or fatty acid metabolism, but there are other applications and new tools, and I'll just tell you about a few of them briefly here. Uh, in this study from Beijing, they used a probe that was based on fibroblast activation protein inhibitor, or FAPI, which is used to detect fibroblasts and fibrotic remodeling in tissues. And this was used in a population of PAH patients 
um, and found to bind preferentially to decompensated RVs and those with reduced RV fractional area change and reduced TAPSI. And so there were, as you might expect, positive correlations with total pulmonary resistance and NT-proBMP. Um, it's a small study and it's um, unclear uh, how, how this would fit in with what we've already learned from our metabolic imaging, but you can see here, even uh, across the spectrum of patients, these two being decompensated uh, with lower TAPC and lower RV fractional area changes versus this better compensated patient, there is a marked change in the amount of uptake of this FAPI. So in principle, we can monitor fibrosis using PET imaging as well in the RV. Um, there are some modalities that we are using in some of our studies right now. This is a neuroendocrine tumor probe called NetSpot. It's gallium dotatate, which is an octreotide analog, and it binds, in addition to neuroendocrine tumors like carcinoid, also binds to macrophages, which express the same somatostatin type 2 receptor. And it turns out that you can tag macrophages that light up in uh, culprit arteries in carotid syndromes, in acute coronary syndromes, and in myocarditis from different etiologies, idiopathic myocarditis, sarcoid, um, a bunch of other modalities. And we are actively looking at whether this could uh, examine RV inflammation as well as pulmonary vascular inflammation. And you've seen a lot of FDG being used to label the RV, and it's definitely the brightest signal when you scan somebody's uh, lung fields, but some people have looked carefully using dynamic scanning on whether or not there's increased glucose utilization in the pulmonary vascular tissues, hypothesizing that those same processes of altered metabolism, of uh, potentially increased uh, tissue mass from remodeling, as well as inflammation might be in play. And in this uh, small pilot study, uh, from Lanzhou and, and uh, Lei Wang again, we see that there are elevated ratios in IPH and possibly even more elevated ratios in uh, lupus-associated pulmonary arterial hypertension. So looking beyond that bright RV signal, there, there might be more to be gained from this metabolic imaging technique. Okay, so I'll summarize by saying again that FDG PET imaging can detect abnormal uh, metabolism, uh, compensatory versus non-compensatory changes, potentially and definitely prognosis, and track responses to therapy. Uh, there are novel PET CT modalities that can detect RV inflammation, fibrosis, and even cell proliferative activity with more specificity. And I think uh, it's, it's clear that PET CT imaging will have some important roles in understanding specific mechanisms of RV compensation and failure, and especially in the development of novel therapies targeting metabolism, fibrosis, and inflammation. I want to conclude by thanking our collaborators, uh, including Heather Jacine and Marcelo DiCarli at Brigham, who have taught me pretty much uh, everything I know about nuclear imaging. I'm not a radiologist or a nuclear car cardiologist, but I've learned a lot from this team. Thanks. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Nick Rahagi who's an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a member of our pulmonary vascular disease team. Nick has a rather unique background in engineering and AI, and he's helped to develop or developed unique approaches using CT to quantify changes in the pulmonary circulation in, in disease and in response to therapies. And his work has really provided us with these stunning images of the pulmonary vasculature and new ways to assess both the vasculature and the RV based on 2D scans. So he'll talk to us today about advanced imaging approaches to assessing pulmonary vascular remodeling and RV function. Thank you, thanks for the uh, introduction and the opportunity to speak. Um, I have a couple of uh, challenges. One is, one is that I am the imposter in this group. I am, I am not the cardiologist and this is an RV. Uh, symposium. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the RV imaging, but um, you, part of my task is also to talk a little bit about the imaging outside of the domain of, uh, of the immediate vicinity of the RV. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about cardiac MRI, uh, uh, covering some of the things that uh, haven't been already covered, uh, as well as the CT imaging of the pulmonary vascular structure, talk a little bit about MRI 
going back to MRI uh, in the vasculature. Uh, then we'll uh, finish off with talking about some of the uh, uh, things that we can look forward to in uh, imaging uh, and perfusion using CT. Um, in general, I think there's two different flavors of, uh, of, of advancements, since my talk says advanced imaging. Uh, one type of advancement that I'll talk about throughout this talk is, is uh, technology, meaning physical things, and then the other type of advancement has to do with software and the processing. And so these are sort of the two different things that are happening in, in the different uh, modalities. In cardiac MRI, I think that the, you know, the, the quality of the imaging and the quality of the um, devices have been fairly well established. Uh, the uh, basic things that you can do with a cardiac MRI include looking at uh, geometry, looking at RVPA coupling, which has been mentioned a couple of times already, and looking at strain in the same uh, manner as, uh, as was talked about earlier with speckle tracking. You can look at tissue, and, and you can look at, uh, by giving gadolinium, look at the behavior of the ga gadolinium in the tissue. Uh, and then uh, you can look at different types of imaging, and we'll briefly mention black blood imaging and flow imaging. But I think the most um, sort of immediate out of the box uh, uh, things that you can get from cardiac MRI is a very good, uh, relatively high resolution image of what happens in the RV. And you can, you know, I, I've, I, I, I firmly believe that, that the last advancement in humanity will be to be able to play a video in, in PowerPoint, so I'm not even going to attempt to do that. that that's like, uh, you know, we'll never conquer that challenge. But, but basically, I, I will ask you to imagine that that uh, that uh, you know th these are uh, going to be animated, and you can see the outline of the uh, right ventricle as the heart is pumping, and you can see how the chamber is evolving, and you can get. Uh, what is in the lower panels, a strain image, much like uh, what was shown earlier with the echo. Um, and so the challenge has actually been uh, not necessarily just getting these images, but what to do with them and how to quantify them. And um, you know, some of the basic things that have been pretty well established and are quote unquote easy to do are chamber size dimensions, just getting the size of the chambers. But some of the markers that have been fairly well studied is the end systolic volume index and the end diastolic volume index. Uh, there's a significant amount of literature validating the utility of these. Uh, there's also the counterpart mass measurements where you attempt, because you have density and you have material composition, to measure the sort of the muscle mass of that uh, chamber, uh, those don't seem to perform as well in studies trying to predict uh, outcomes or uh, sort of immediate clinic utilities, but are still pretty good. And then there's the RV ejection fraction, which you can estimate uh, much similar to what you would estimate uh, with the echo on the LV side. Um, but again, in this field, the real advancement, the front, is about automated co uh, computation and automated uh, calculation. And this is where uh, AI has, um, again, made a huge uh, uh, contribution. In fact, one could argue that sort of the front wave of AI is image processing and machine vision. And so that's where it did a lot of the impact of AI in, in the field of imaging uh, is seen. And there has been a number of publications from many groups, but this is an example of an algorithm uh, that uses uh, uh, deep, deep learning to automatically uh, put a, um, a uh, circle uh, around the um, chamber. And then what you can do is between each uh, time point gated by the EKG, uh, measure the size of the chamber and look at the way the chamber is evolving. And this has been validated looking at sort of the different parts and look, comparing what a human does compared to uh, what the machine learning algorithm does, and the agreement is actually really, really good. And there's been a lot of progress. The initial attempts at this were not super, but the, the, there's been a lot of progress in making these uh, all, almost as good as, as a human. Uh, some would argue maybe even better. Uh, and this is a this is a, um, a study that was recently done uh, from the uh, uh, Sheffield, Sheffield group, looking again at at um, uh, 
how automated computations of, for example, our VLB ch chamber side uh, compared with uh, the what would have been um, uh, human versions of the same estimates. And in fact, they uh, they correlated it. Uh, they showed that there was better correlation with actual uh, hemodynamic measures than what the humans uh, were able to do. Um, Another thing that has been uh, what has been discussed significantly is is the RVPA interaction and the coupling, and this was uh, I think discussed uh, pretty ex extensively earlier. But just adding that that increasingly we are um, leveraging cardiac MRI to uh, estimate this this concept. You know, <clears throat> initially when this concept arose, the um, the uh, uh, gold standard, and I think it's still some would argue is a gold standard. Here's some controversy. I'm sure there'll be some debate about this. Uh, that that this is something you have to do with a right heart cath and occlusion, and uh, uh, and now in increasingly uh, imaging is being used to estimate RVPA coupling. Um, but one of the other ways that computational work is being uh, uh, leveraged here uh, is actually not necessarily even AI, but actually good old-fashioned computational uh, modeling. And you know, with the improved image quality, you can see a lot more. You can get a much better uh, version of, of of these cardiac MRIs. And you know, to do fluid dynamics simulations takes a lot of computational power. And I remember this was something that was relegated to supercomputers in the 90s. Uh, but now these are the kinds of things you can do on a desktop. And um, the pulmonary artery uh, is where the disease starts to um, move more and more from the distal to the proximal. And this has been leveraged to look at uh, uh, blood flow, because in the same way as you can speckle track in the echo, you can speckle track uh, in the uh, pulmonary artery, and this, but this time the speckles are red blood cells. So you can track the trajectory, and these little blue lines are, are, are little paths uh, uh, of the R RBCs moving around. And as you go from um, uh, the sort of the baseline to the deeper parts of the systole, and you have pulmonary or, or hypertension, actually, uh, you end up forming these little eddies. You start developing turbulence. And uh, this is a work that was done by the Colorado group and uh, uh, showing that, these, that, that the eddy formation and the creation of turbulence is something that's proportional to the uh, pulmonary uh, uh, vascular uh, pressures and the development of disease. And this is actually a um, recent publication, I believe this is the uh, group from Austria, that showed that you know they built a you know an algorithm that was tuned on this uh, the presence and development of this uh, uh, turbulence and you see you know this is a uh, uh, going from frame two to the frame seven and their estimate of the mean PA pressure compared to the right heart cath mean pressure mean PA pressure is is pretty startling um, I mean of course it's a small group and and things always look better when when you do it in the the expert group does it, but it is nonetheless pretty promising results. Shifting to the CT and more to the um, uh, pulmonary vasculature, uh, I want to motivate the work in CT. So, you know, MRI has really beautiful ability to look at things in time. Uh, CT has the advantage when it comes to uh, 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 resolution, particularly in the lung, because there's a strong amount of air-water interface that really messes with MRI, which is why MRI resolution in space it, in the lungs doesn't tend to be very good. Um, but the truth is that that people have been looking at uh, the vascular loss of vascular uh, detail or this phenomenon of pruning since um, ver very olden times. These, uh, this is work by Lynn Reed, and actually this is a work by Marlene Rabinovich, who is now at Stanford, when she was working with Lynn Reed way back when, in the 1980s, when she was here, looking at this phenomenon of vascular simplification. And their, their tools were uh, very simple. They were basically uh, plain photographs of angiograms, and yet they were able to do things like quantify fractal dimension and, and tree complexity even at that time and show difference between disease and normal. 
Um, really here, the, the, the innovation has been, you know, CT scans are better resolution than they were, you know, 10 years ago. There's no doubt about that. But the real revolution there has also been in, in quantification. Um, and so we have a, a, a process for uh, analyzing CT scans that uh, I appreciate uh, Jane giving me credit for, but that I, I, I really rely on a big team that uh, does all, all, all of this. But uh, it, you, as you will see, or as I'm pointing out here, now uh, many of these processes, like separating the lung from the uh, rest of the CT scan, identifying the vessels, identifying the airways, counting and s measuring the vessels, separating them between arteries and veins is all being uh, done uh, with AI. And so that really then enables us to do things with what is essentially clinical CT scans. So these are clinical CT scans uh, obtained at Brigham in three patients, uh, one with PAH, one with exercise pH, and one control. And it's color-coded by the size of the vessel. Um, and what you see is a progression from control having a more and more of the volume distributed in vessels that are small, meaning red, to central dilation and loss of the small vessel volume. And this was a work that we uh, published in CHESS showing that, that you can use that as a, as a, a marker of disease. Um, and as I mentioned, you separate them into uh, arteries and veins. And what we found was that you, uh, the, what you see is a loss of distal vascular volume in both the arterial and the venous uh, phase of the circulation. But in the arteries, as you would expect, much like you see PA dilation, you also then see the arteries dilate. Um, and recently, we also showed that in PVH, uh, or at least in group two, uh, secondary to heart disease, you also see venous proximal dilation. Um, another marker that has been discussed in the past uh, that uh, uh, was, uh, I think, first uh, mentioned by the group from Graz is the vascular uh, tortuosity. And we found the same thing in PAH. We found that 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 there is increased in the tortuosity of the uh, arteries, particularly, and not the veins, uh, and that it was a feature that actually was found even early on in, in exercise pH, uh, before they had developed resting uh, pulmonary hypertension. Um, but, you know, the, this kind of thing has been also observed, again, and historically there was this concept of the Westermark sign that people used in chest x-rays to detect PE, which was an area that just didn't seem to have a lot of vas vasculature or vascular markings in, in chest x-rays. And you can do the same thing. This is a CT angiography of a person who has a very, very occlusive, but very also localized uh, clot showing a right middle lobe that's basically not flowing. And you can quantify that on CT imaging. And uh, this was work that was done by Jasleen, who is now at Penn. And uh, this built, we built a Brigham submassive PE cohort and showed that the lack of uh, vascular volume uh, distally, particularly on the venous side, was fairly well correlated with all these different measures of RV dysfunction, uh, as well as biomarkers, and uh, ultimately with mortality in the submassive PE. So these are patients that are sort of the, the people that we always struggle with trying to figure out what to do for them. Um, Currently, one of the things we're looking at is, is trying to distinguish or, or leverage uh, not just the vascular volume, but the spatial heterogeneity. Uh, this is work that uh, I'm working with Andrew Sin at Beth Israel with. And uh, this is looking at, at spatial heterogeneity. So the, the, whoops, the vasculature uh, 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 lost, uh, the pruning is a phenomenon you see in PAH and in CTEF and pretty much a any pulmonary vascular disease that I've looked at so far. But one of the things that happens in CTEF is you get spatial heterogeneity. So this is uh, uh, our preliminary data showing that uh, as you go from uh, control to, to PAH and CTEF, you do lose distal vasculature. But the difference between PAH and CTEF is the spatial variability. And um, I think that, that this may, my hope is that this can potentially identify the sort of the diffuse vascular phenotype of CTEF as opposed to the sort of the more proximal uh, regional uh, version of CTEF. And then lastly is, is using CT imaging to look at uh, change. 
Um, and one of the things that we showed early on is that with nitric oxide, you can actually see the change in vascular volume and you can map it. And, and this is just um, a picture showing, if you stare at this long enough, uh, um, you will find that this has a little bit more vasculature in it. But this is a map that shows uh, in red is, is, is the segments that dilated or appeared and, and in yellow are the se segments that are stable. Um, we, uh, this kind of technology has now um, made it into the uh, quote unquote real world and uh, there's a couple of I think trials that are leveraging these kinds of CT before and after to look at blood volume changes as a response to therapy. Okay, now going back to uh, cardiac MRI, um, blood flow uh, is something you can look at uh, uh, with cardiac MRI and one of the things you can look at is circuit transit time so you can look at how long it takes for uh, things to make it from the RV to the LV and compute and use that as a measure of the circulation through the pulmonary vasculature. Uh, there's also black blood imaging, which is uh, uh, one of the ways you can uh, look at, or early ways that, of looking at this concept of turbulence forming at the edges. But I think one of the uh, more interesting things that is emerging is uh, this use of uh, hyperpolarized xenon. So hyperpolarized xenon requires you to take xenon gas, hyperpolarize it, so you need a hyper polarizer, and then you uh, put people in the MRI, and the different compartments, meaning the barrier, uh, uh, the air, and the red blood cells have different absorption patterns, and what you get are these images. Uh, this is a patient who's healthy, this is PAH, and this is ILD, and what you get is that as you go from uh, control to uh, PAH and ILD, the RBC part uh, of the signal starts to spatially deteriorate. But the difference between ILD and PAH is that in, in PAH you don't have a big barrier signal, whereas in the ILD you have a huge barrier signal. So then you, you know, lack of a barrier signal but an RBC defect tells you you have PAH. In addition, what they have found is that if you look at those signals over time that there's an oscillatory pattern and that patients with PAH have sort of a lower amplitude uh, uh, oscillation. So these kinds of observations are being used now, and there, there's a big push right now for different centers to get these hyperpolarizers and investigate these more thoroughly. Um, last topic I'll, I'll discuss is the idea of using, uh, of looking at perfusion with CT imaging. And the current uh, state of the art there is uh, this concept of dual energy CT imaging. And the basic premise is that, you know, X-ray, just like any light, has different absorption for different materials. And we tend to use one X-ray frequency wavelength, uh, but why not use two? And so each vendor has de developed their own way of uh, detecting and emitting different frequencies, and they all pretty much have a version of this. And so what you do is you give people contrast, just like you would uh, CTPE, uh, and the, from the clinician standpoint, you get the same thing. You get a CT angiography that you can look at, but then you have the opportunity to use those two different frequencies that are combined to make the normal CT you're used to look at, but now you can also do a different thing, which is using the sort of the physics of the absorption, you can make this, uh, uh, iodine map, where in this case the color corresponds to the density of iodine, and you can see this is a pulmonary angiogram with two defects and quasi-similar areas of defect, although literature has always shown that no matter how you do it, the concept of perfusion always looks a little different depending on how you look at it. Uh, so it's never an exact match, which could be an opportunity actually. Uh, but, but you get these sort of very qualitative uh, um, maps that show you these diffu uh, this perfusion defects. And you can leverage that and, and you know, a lot of CTEF centers use it to, as a way to sort of complement VQ uh, spec or ways to sort of get a sense of what parts of the um, uh, lung they may decide to act upon. But it does take a lot of sort of having seen a lot of them and uh, uh, to, to put it to use, but it does use the same contrast and radiation exposure and from, you know, these CT scanners look like any other CT scanner and your patient goes through it without knowing anything about the fact that it's dual energy. Uh, the main challenge is that it's not, a, you know, you have to get the extra equipment but, and, and quantification has been a bit challenging because it's optimized for visualization. I would show you some data, but both in the interest of time and also because I think this is 
uh, that dual energy is already on its way out. Uh, the real the real frontier um, that is happening in almost sort of a revolutionary pace is the is the introduction of uh, photon counting detectors. So the main thing here is that this is the old architecture of the CT images or our CT scanners, where the X-ray comes, it gets turned into visible light, and then a photodiode turns this into uh, an electronic signal. So there's a middle uh, middle person here. Uh, that is convert, converting X-ray into visible light. Our technology has moved enough now that we don't need that, uh, that middle interface. And what that does is it reduces the number of uh, things that can cause interference. And on, on a very basic level, does two things. One is it allows us to uh, have a much better resolution. And two is that now, instead of having two different detectors for each X-ray image, like dual energy does, you can have a detector that measures the X-ray frequency at any frequency. And so you can get a continuous spectrum of the frequency of the absorption of the material. Um, and so you get, for the same amount of radiation, higher exposures, clear images, uh, and less variability, and the opportunity potentially to do better reconstructions. Um, this is just, uh, um, uh, and as my, uh, my disclosure said, I, I, don't, I, I'm, I don't get paid by Siemens, uh, despite, despite uh, me uh, using their, these slides. Uh, but but uh, the uh, improved resolution in the lung uh, it can be shown here. You can see like these little vessels now coming into much clearer view. And you can see like there's an airway there that you wouldn't have necessarily seen on the uh, uh, older images. And then you get this much better uh, 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 resolution of the perfusion maps. And different, different vendors are all developing this technology, but what's significant is that it's all being pushed now in the sense that uh, all the new CT scanners that are gonna be built uh, and sold are going to have this in it. And so this is not going to be something that's going to be just sort of like relegated to our, our pet uh, uh, center where we just do experimental work, but is actually going to be in the clinical workflow. So in conclusion, Cardiac MRI continues to provide additional venues for exploring RV function and advanced hemodynamics, particularly with computational methods. Uh, the automated methods, I think, will really enable us to do to do work much like uh, Francois presented, where you get all these different uh, measurements and try to figure out what from that you can use uh, uh, to make decisions. The pulmonary vascular measurements from CT scan have information in them about disease that, that we can harness in an automated way. And both the new uh, CT and MRI technology, as well as the molecular imaging, which I didn't touch on because I figured we would get a good intro to, uh, are uh, going to actually give us a lot better of a window into the pulmonary circulation. All right, so we'll open the floor for questions. Um, I'll start one, since all of you have talked about imaging in different aspects. And I think as both interested in clinical practice as well as research, and really trying to tie physiology with what we do, how do we take all this imaging and use it both clinically in the acute setting, thinking about patients who come in in failure, what can we gain from these imaging modalities that guide us with treatment, as well as long-term? And I think long-term, it, it's easier to conceive how all of this applies. But really thinking about the acute management of patients, and then also clinical trials. How do these things affect the future of clinical trials? And it's to all four of you. So obviously, I'm biased. but. ECHO is a non-invasive tool that can be used at the bedside to give you a flavor of what is going on in real time. There's, um, you can also do post-processing on clinically acquired images. It's cheap. It's readily available. Um, it's increasingly being used in the acute care setting. Um, so not to diminish the other contribution of these tools, we actually have an interesting state-of-the-art review coming out on how um, we can clinically use all of these tools in a smart way based off of the patient. Um, but I will say that oftentimes your first signal is on the echo. Um, 
So I, I think it's, it's an exciting thing because it's so cheap and everyone has one. Um, in every unit, the ED has it, the ICUs have it, um, and we can use speckle tracking on clinically acquired images. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so so I, th I think there's, the, the value is really, I think, an in integration, and it will depend on the case use we want to do it. If we want to do a case use for detection of disease, we'll have to use different algorithm and really use all the tools we want to, we need. If we want to do acute care, it's going to be a different set of tools. For detection, for example, I think CT will, will echo is always the, the mainstay when people get evaluated, but I think it, would, it starts with good PROs or good questions, and CT, what people get, will play an incredible role, especially with the methods that Nick just discussed, I think will play an, an incredible role with PA pulsatility. That's also integrated. I think on echo, what we miss a lot is uh, we don't do good quality, always pulmonary flow, or not, don't look a lot at geometry, and I think we needed our centers to focus more on that. The other one that we forget a lot on echo is septal motion that's often early, and, and uh, beautiful cases with, with Dr. Zemania, and when we look at the, the cases that we missed early, and and that pushed a lot the septal motion uh, that has early changes. I think in, in the acute setting, I think is again shifting the focus from the RV to, to ventricular interactions mm -hmm. and really looking what does the RV LV interaction look like and what is systemic congestion looking like also and try to optimize that management. I think some nice work from Andre Deneau in the ICU and, uh, and Montreal Heart, they showed that by focusing on venous success imaging, they really decreased their, their length of stay in post cardiac surgery and, and their outcome. And I think refocusing on and that venous flow will be very, very important. And I think for echo or all imaging is moving away a little bit from predicting survival to really ensuring quality and consistency. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that would be another way to integrate them. Um, so uh, I, think, I think that, that um, the speaking from, uh, again, the imposter point of view, uh, uh, I would say that that some of the uh, roles that things like CT have to play uh, in the future have really to do with the fact that our disease definitions um, really rely on catching the disease as it is impacting the hemodynamics significantly and the right ventricle significantly. And so one could argue that while that's the most important thing, obviously, to prevent people from dying, that you are catching things by the by that point, a significant part of the pulmonary vascular bed is already destroyed, and so you are catching things late in the game. I think another role that, in general, all of these imaging modalities can play is in phenotyping, and, and sort of, again, the, the battle with the group one through group five designation and really trying to come up with a more personalized approach to treating things, and imaging, I think, can play a role there. I think the biggest challenge, honestly, in incorporating all these things, and it, this has, I think, always been the case with imaging, is standardization. It, it, until groups, things get advanced enough and people gather together and set standards, work is going to be hard to reproduce. And, and once work is not easy to reproduce, then clinicians are not going to trust it. Uh, no, you know, and that's, that's one of the fundamental challenges that imaging always faces, I think. The, the, those are great points, Nick. Uh, you know, in sort of framing what PET imaging can do for us, you've seen that there's a pretty large body of evidence that it, it can be very predictive of the uh, metabolic disarray in the RV, and we even have some standardized metrics. But uh, what we don't have are uh, a lot of data to show that the information that we get from this modality um, is, is capturing something that's not present in the other signals that are more readily available. And so until we have that, it's gonna be hard to uh, argue for the widespread use of these other than as research tools, but especially as drug development tools where we're specifically targeting metabolism. I think that's the, the chief value. But as a cardiologist, we do use these myocardial uh, ammonia and FTG PET scans to look for ischemia, viability, and um, I, I'm hoping that over time some of these uh, concepts will spill over into people interested in RV performance and we'll have specific questions that we can address clinically. Yeah. So just for fun, to, ex to expand on what Aaron got to, all right? 
other than exploratory land, other than exploratory points in clinical trials and potential phenotyping, when, the wor when push comes to shove at the end of the day, because of standardization, availability, complexity, et cetera, not all four of these are ever going to be used in any patient. I mean, I'm sorry, they're great, but it's not going to happen, okay, in expense. So five years from now, 10 years from now, just for the hell of it, which one of these four do you think will be used to actually take care of patients? I realize you have your favorites, but go for it. <laughs> which, way, which direction do we want to start? We can start with Paul. We'll go in reverse. Well, I, you know, I think that skepticism is warranted, but um, I, I'm so impressed with the information that we get from cardiac MRI, and especially with novel protocols and novel um, uh, refinements to the imaging technology that I imagine that that's going to be increasingly first line for examining such a geometrically complex organ as the RV. And my hope is that we'd couple that with some sort of molecular imaging to add uh, to that picture. Um, first of all, my answer to that question is that's exactly why more research is needed and we need more money to do that research. Um, but, but, um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, so I, I, I definitely agree that, that a lot of the speckle tracking and automated measurements from cardiac MRI are going to start making it into our reports. So we'll have that data available to us now more and more so we can make decisions. You know, once you start reporting it, we start using it. Um, I think on the CT side, the areas where I actually do see in five to 10 years people using things is in screening and particularly group three patients for uh, a PAH, for uh, a referral to right heart caths. And then the other area where I think a lot more advanced technologies are, are going to integrate themselves into workflow is in the PE CTEF area. Because I think in those areas, people already spend a lot of time s s looking and staring at CT scans, looking for clues. And so once you add a number to it, then that makes it a lot easier for them to use. It won't be too hard to push that into that group. No, thank you for, for the question. I think that it depends also on, on the use, use case also, but I think for monitoring, I think having integrated scores when we look at an echo will become more much more practice. Like the, the reveal echo score was interesting. I think we'll integrate that more for prognosis. We'll develop better integrated tools, I think, more Bayesian tools for, for the detection on echo and, and more integrated quality on the echo. I think that's gonna make it to practice. I think to monitor patient using more sensors, and, and, and better tools or, or better integrated PROs for clinical practice and monitoring patients will be more cost effective and we'll use that much more than we're doing right now when we're starting to integrate it more in our clinical practice from day to day. So I will say that risk stratification has made its way to echo reporting in that, for example, in DETECT that we use in scleroderma patients, they rely heavily on the TRV max and the right atrial area. and so. As a practice, we have actually now changed our echo report, so that is something in our measurement list. So these two things of how we report, how we improve quality really go hand in hand, and hopefully we're going to start seeing that at the patient level. Um, but it starts with work like this. So thank you. Anton. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was uh, staying behind, uh, Aaron, uh, you have, and I saw that you have all your conflicts of interest on your back. I was quite impressed. <laughs> if you look to the shirt of HEP. But that was not my question. I've, if I'm allowed, I have questions to all of you because I have, uh, and I do think actually the answer on your question, stroke volume and heart rate is really uh, imp very important. But if I may start with Francois, you put forward this cardiopulmonary unit as a very important uh, concept, and especially also uh, venous congestion. And I loved the ideas and the concept you have with that. And also you showed the network of things you are doing. But then indeed, we also a little bit get stuck into the complexity. So uh, 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 a little bit alluding on what Hap said. So together with Robert, how, how should we push this forward? Because every year we get new parameters and we get stuck into that. And so, um, uh, and the clinician wanted simple things and probably with one simple parameter catch everything, which is probably is complex. So what's the way forward? Should we use artificial intelligence, large platforms to get it sorted out? 
or should we use physiological knowledge, pre-knowledge, and move forward? What, what, so together with Farber, what, what, what do you think? What's the, the way forward? No, thank you. I, I agree with you that we, we always have so many parameters that it often gets confusing. Per personally, when I look at the echo, I pay a lot of attention to the septal shape and the septal motion, the RV shape, especially the apex, the septal motion in the right atrium. And I think I, it's a quick look. Uh, when, when we look at the echo, I focus a lot on these five parameters. And I think it tells us a lot about both, both detection and about prognosis. And that makes it much more focused to, to align. You have a good question, will AI really play a, a major role or not? I, I think for ECHO, I think there's the intermediate is using engineered features, better features that we engineer that we combine through models, through models for like Bayesian networks or other models that we could combine for information. But I'm not sure we need that degree of complexity because of the interrelation between all the features we have in PH. So, so I think if we do a good job by the engineer features, we could still improve the detection better and the AI could help be a second check to have a help the clinical decision making that we don't miss anything on the echo. So I see that's complementary. So, so I think we could be very focused in the way we look at an echo. We don't need, we don't need 100 metric, we don't need all the curves. Could be very focused and get algorithms with very limited parameters. And AI will be a native tool to clinical decision making that that will be used. I think everybody's going to use it as an aided clinical decision making. And do you agree, Farbert? You agree with Franz, what Francois said? Is that the way forward? Kind of. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I think there's a lot of information in, in the basal free wall. Um, I think when the basal free wall starts to fail, that that's a bad prognostic sign. Yeah, Monica, and that's yeah. what I wanted to ask you, because the yeah. basal, the apex, of, uh, you showed very nicely in the exercise that the apex had to do the work much more than the basal field, which is a little bit odd. I mean, because you would expect that uh, the billow function uh, is, is lost uh, somehow, and the apex already is on a high stress. So first of all, what's the explanation for this? Because I'm intrigued by this finding. So do you think it has to do with the fiber uh, orientation, which is changing? I think it's, fi yeah, fiber insertion, and it's overlaying the LV, and it becomes hypercontractile and tethers, yeah. I think so. And the second is, is this also happening because in your example, you showed quite a triangular shape of the right ventricle. Is this also happening in the patient with the overarching um, uh, right ventricle. It's also th that, that the apex contributes more to the exercise stroke for him than also oh, it's in every patient. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so that these are examples of group one, really. Um, I haven't actually described that same progression as cleanly in the other groups. So in that group one phenotype, you really see that progression, which is similar to what you showed in the in your Jack paper. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I have a question to Paul, if I'm allowed to. Because Paul, you showed very nicely uh, the, the story of the PET imaging of the FTG, and then we thought it was much more the mitochondrial reflecting mitochondrial dysfunction, Wartburg effect, and so on. Although Kluck already showed that this related to stroke work, but then we looked at the fatty exit uh, um, oxidation, and then the, 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 it becomes more blurred. And then there might be explanation, so the, the trace is not sensitive enough or not, or it might be that the concept is wrong. And I, I just wanted to have your opinion about that. <laughs> and I saw see Stephen there. <laughs> Still, Ned. No, I, I was expecting more from that fatty acid uh, probe uh, to help define what, what actually is happening with fatty acid oxidation, but um, you're absolutely right. It's just one long branch chain fatty acid. I don't know if that's the, the right substrate. I, I think it needs to be revisited. Um, it may just be a heterogeneous signal. These are all very small studies too, and so if there is a very uh, important signal that by some other gold standard uh, is equivalent to a decompensated phenotype that, that would need to be concentrated to really understand the physiologic meaning of these. So has it, has it blurred? I think 
the glucose metabolism is definitely dysregulated and very, very consistent, at least in most group one pH, maybe not CHD pH, but uh, fatty acid metabolism, um, I agree, uh, both from preclinical and this clinical data, it's a little less clear and needs a little bit more work. Thank you. Rohan. Hey, good morning. I always find it intimidating to follow a Dutch guy with a low tone of voice. I don't know how you guys did really great answering. So um, one quick comment to jump off on what happened, Aaron, you were saying. I do think it's relevant, it's really important that maybe these technologies are expensive and we don't know how to incorporate them in our clinical practice, but they're going to be critical for evaluating treatment response, especially with therapies that are coming up now, that we may want to design trials with withdrawal of drugs and uh, effect, uh, uh, looking at the effect of withdrawing the drug and sustainability of effect in, quote, disease-modifying drugs. So I do think we have to put our money down in some of the technologies here to, for the next generation of therapeutics that we're trying. I have a quick question for Paul. Uh, first of all, excellent session. Um, to jump off of what you just said, um, insulin resistance and metabolic shift is a systemic phenomenon in heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. And I've never really, uh, these are beautiful pictures, but I've never seen anyone put context to what does, what happens to myocardial metabolism within the realm of a systemically dysfunctional metabolism, insulin resistance, diabetes, and how does that shape what you're seeing or limit what we're imaging from the FDG PET approach? Yeah, that's, that's a great question on a couple of fronts. Uh, some of these studies have carefully controlled for diabetes as a confounder for these, either in um, assessing it as a variable or excluding or including these patients, but they're an important part of the phenotype, for sure. Dynamic imaging actually takes into account changes in glucose. These studies are done under fasting conditions, but there is a, uh, an important um, equilibrium that's used to measure uptake rates based on plasma glucose and what we think is uh, tissue glucose uptake in these studies. And so, um, the data may be there in these dynamic scans as far as what uh, insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome are changing these parameters, but I haven't yet seen it looked at in a systematic way. But the information may be there. Okay, thank you. Did you want to ask a question, Jane? Oh, sure. And then Franz. All right. I have one after that. Go ahead, Jane. Too. All right, so uh, this is a question that was sort of debated hotly last week among the cardiologists at the American Heart Meeting, but you know, with all of these imaging modalities, when is the right time to get these, you know, to do the test? Is it really after we, you know, when the patient comes in acutely, is it after we diurese them to their dry weight? And how do, how does this change for phenotyping and prognosis? So I think both. So what we have shown in the ECHO literature, at least, is that the following of a contractile measure over PASP, so like the tapsy papsy coupling ratio, is more important than using any of those markers in isolation. So what we typically do is, you know, a patient walks into the hospital, they get a CT, they get an ECHO, um, and then after we diurese to their dry weight, we are repeating a limited RV-focused ECHO, looking at those specific parameters. Yeah. And does the... I'm sorry to jump in, but the tethering, especially in the changes in the longitudinal, and but is that sensitive enough to show a change in just having diuresis the patient? Yeah. Yeah. And is it enough to guide when we've reached that point without taking them back to the cath lab? That I haven't looked at. Um, in particular, the dynamic changes in RV strain. We have looked at the performance of RV strain as the numerator. So we've looked at what's more important, numerator, tissue Doppler, fractional area change, or TAPSI. And interestingly enough, it seems like fractional area change is actually the best contractile measure because it takes into account the geometric configuration of the RV as a marker of, you know, is your end diastolic area actually going down with time? And is the RV assuming a normal contour versus a lot of these measures are just tracking that longitudinal motion? So fractional area change over PAPC may actually be the best coupling marker. 
Thanks you all again for a great session. Um, Dr. Rahagi, I'm gonna pick on you because you uh, so eloquently uh, had some imaging of the pulmonary vasculature and this is sort of a piggyback onto what uh, Roham was saying about disease modification. Um, and I think, I, as I see it, there's two problems with our current modalities um, when we're assessing response to potentially disease modifi modification. Um, one is the resolution, of course, the, in a sense, when we look at the histopathology, we're looking at vessels, uh, precapillary vessels like five, 500 microns, right? We, uh, in, in essence, I don't believe are, you know, measuring directly to that resolution um, our, our vessels. Uh, secondly, when we look at uh, potential um, response to therapy or disease modification, are, are, do we have the spatial resolution to see that we are actually modifying flow to disease capillaries rather than potentially diverting flow to non-diseased areas in the lungs? So what do you think of the modalities you pointed out what may or potentially address those two issues in the future? Um, excellent uh, question, and I think I think there's a couple of dimensions to that, to the answer. I think one of them is that, you know, with, with the photon counting, I think we're getting 500 microns is half a millimeter, and we're getting close to being able to see structures of that size. Uh, with the help of AI, we have some data to show that we can actually even uh, estimate the size at a subvoxel resolution. But so we are getting closer, but I think fundamentally your point is, is well taken, which is that where the real action is, which is the really tiny arterioles and, and capillaries, we still can't see those. So what we're doing is we are correlating and we are, we are saying that changes in these larger vessels reflect changes downstream. And we're further positing that since we're closer to the action than the RV, that maybe we're a little bit more sensitive. But at, at the end of the day, you're right. We're, we're not actually you know, looking at those structures where, where the sort of the remodeling begins. Um, but I think the way forward for that, at least within the realm of CT and potentially with the realm of MRI, is looking at the concept of perfusion. And I think that's where you get to see uh, perhaps a, a, a not necessarily the single uh, vessels that where the action is occurring, uh, but, but where the, you can see the flow through the, those vessels and the amount that, it, the, that the blood is really you know, penetrating and flowing through the tissue. And that's where I think dual energy and photon counting and molecular markers and MRI and all these things could potentially answer that. Now, the, how does that relate to the word disease modifying? I mean, that is such a loaded word and there are, uh, you know, you, that's a whole conference onto itself. Uh, um, but, but I think to the question of whether we're affecting the target small vessels, I think perfusion is probably the way we're going to uh, start looking at that. And Thank actually you. to that end, and there will be a whole thing on disease modifying later, but the, I was intrigued by your speckle tracking and the systemic sclerosis that it's so different in the absence of diagnosed pulmonary hypertension, but thinking about what you're saying about the ability to measure flow and thinking about pulsatility and distensibility, is there a way of unifying, in contrast to Hap's idea, uh, all these imaging <laughs> modalities so that we could potentially diagnose early pulmonary vascular disease where treatment may probably have a much better impact, especially in the systemic sclerosis patients? I guess we need to meet Nick. <laughs> yes, Sydney's yeah, trying to make that happen. No, it's a great idea. Did um, those patients go on to develop? Uh, and why were the echoes done? Was it just? Yeah, so, they were, so our center's practice is to do yearly echoes on every single systemic sclerosis patient. So we have a very large repository to study from. Um, in that exercise paper that I showed, we studied about 58 patients with shortness of breath who had scleroderma. Um, and about 25% of that population develop overt resting pulmonary hypertension in five years. So um, there's another study that we did where we looked at about 87 
mild PAH patients with systemic sclerosis, 50% of them died within five years. So there's a lot of information that can be gained from clinically obtained imaging that we should be using very rigorously. Yeah, because so we probably would have done invasive CPAT on those patients and maybe diagnosed exercise pH, whereas always wondering whether the next phase is imaging, whether it be metabolic or flow, that could identify those patients where we could start therapy. Uh, Spencer, Spencer. Spencer Kupo. Um, wonderful uh, conference. I'd like to switch from the high-powered lens to the low-power lens because we're always talking about the delay in referral and how difficult the length of time it takes. And so we have so many great parameters on ECHO, but we need something that the primary care physician can trigger and say, something's wrong, I need to send this to somebody else. On the left heart failure, it's all defaulted to ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is on the ECH all ECHO report. EF is 30%. The primary care physician says, boom, you go to see a cardiologist. Of all the things that we have now, is there something you can predict in the future it will all default to, to the RV failure? This, there's something wrong with the RV cup, uh, uh, that, that any thousands of community hospital echocardiographic labs can all do and they can, boom, trigger a referral. What will that be? So I haven't proven it yet, but I think it's the mid RV chamber. I think when you have an increase in your chamber radius, something bad is happening. Um, and it's a linear dimension. Um, I think pulmonary colleagues have for a very long time overemphasized TAPSI. And again, TAPSI can be really, really normal or even hyperdynamic in overt PAH. So we should not be relying on that. We shouldn't be using PASP. Um, all of these things are important, and especially when you use them together. But I think if there was one single measure that's going to predict that something bad is happening, it is that mid-chamber. When there's an increase in the chamber radius, there's an increase in RV afterload, and the RV is beginning to sphericalize. Thank you. Great talks. Uh, I'm Min Lu from Morphic Therapeutic, um, so I'm on the industry side. Um, I have studied left heart failure, new to RV failure, so I'm really the imposter here. Um, so I have a question about clinical development. Let's say if there's a drug of interest that one wants to demonstrate uh, it, that it can treat RV failure. So obviously, uh, we'll include other endpoints such as you know six minute walk and you know long term outcome, patient reported outcome and stuff. But in terms of imaging. Uh, endpoint, what would you include? And I have heard that RV ejection fraction measured by MRI is the best so far. Would you agree? Uh, do you think things would be different in five, 10 years? Thanks. Yeah, I, I personally, I think ejection fraction is a good metric, but I like the systolic volume personally, and the question is how to best standardize it. Do we need to, you know, three-dimensionally, two-dimensionally, and make sure the two correlate together? I, I like this systolic volume at this time as a simple metric that could integrate a lot of information. Mm -hmm. With severe TR, it's still going to be important, it, and it has the range of change that you could follow the change. If you take NT-pro BNP, for example, a lot of people with mild disease will have normal NT-pro BNP, so you don't have that dynamic range throughout the progression of the disease. Thanks. Thank you. Pleasure. Well, actually, I wonder, too, with Nick, your work, I mean, my, we've never been able, and we never will, biopsy patients with pulmonary vascular disease, but the potential is there that we can do an imaging biopsy and actually see remodeling. So I think you've done some work with that, both with CTEF and PAH. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have, we have um, um, looked at uh, the concept, and actually there's some uh, work that uh, Raul and uh, my collaborators are going to present at PVRI looking at actual uh, vascular remodeling, not just volume, um, uh, that, that, that hope we look forward to presenting at PVRI. So I think there is potential to use our imaging uh, to look at remodeling, but it is remodeling non still nonetheless of, of sort of the mid-sized vessels. But what we have shown in the past is that that remodeling 
uh, is related to the, what's happening. And we do have some histological data, actually, uh, um, from, from patients to back that up. But I think, I think CT's imaging does have a role also to play uh, in response to the earlier question in the community setting. Uh, the PA to A is now kind of becoming a standard thing that's being uh, reported, but it has significant limitations. And what I'm hoping is in the next five to 10 years, we can get more exact risk uh, measures that are reported, at, you know, that are computed that, that tell someone in the community that this vasculature doesn't look right. You should have this person, uh, you know, referred for further workup. Because a lot of people, particularly smokers, get CT scans. Uh, that on a regular basis, all the time. Yeah. And the ability to put together both anatomical, volumetric, and flow might really put the six-minute walk test to bed forever. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Jeff Michelson from Atlanta. Um, nice talks. Thank you for the uh, presentations. But to Francois and Monica, perhaps you could answer, there seems to be a huge disconnect in the clinical arena amongst the um, community echocardiographers, cardiologists, and what they are doing on the reports and what you guys are presenting. And for instance, just maybe the last couple of years, TAPSI has become more prevalent on the reports, and that's not even standard. And you know, the TAPSI now that you're describing is not even something to be relied upon. And they're behind 10 years. And so what I've been looking at over the years and seemingly what looks like a good compromise between the complex logistics of a cardiac MRI and getting that performed in the outpatient setting versus a 2D echo, limitations of the 2D echo would be 3D echo. I only saw one slide on 3D echo. Could you guys comment on where that might play a role down the line in the community setting? as opposed to you know, what you guys are going, what you guys talk about. Is that something that could be done down the road? And secondly, the limitations I've seen in that setting have to do with the echocardiographers, echocardiographers cardiographers themselves and not being up to speed with training for 3D echo or not having the software for 3D echo, not having the ability to you know, obtain that, purchase that type of device. So, you know, as Hap was saying, a lot of these modalities will never be used, but there's got to be something. I thought 3D echo might be the way. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so um, in the updated RV guidelines, we will be giving specific uh, recommendations for screening for pH and what needs to go in a report, and in patients who have established pH, what needs to go in a report. And that's from a sonographer standpoint. And that's from a reporting standpoint as well. So hopefully that will help um, some of these issues because none of that literature um, and none of those recommendations were present in the last iteration of um, our ECHO guidelines. So hopefully that will help. 3D ECHO, you know, the problem is it's time, right? So not only is it the expense of a 3D probe to, to do that, um, but it's also that a lot of these community sonographers are given 15-minute slots to do it an echo. Um, and, you know, there's also all sorts of issues with reimbursement because you could say, what about a limited echo? So a limited echo for those echo readers in the room, it takes the same amount of time to read it, right? And the sonographer is probably spending the same amount of time performing it. Um, it's limited in that it's focused, but then the reimbursement doesn't justify the time. So there's all sorts of nuances as to, you know, why can't we do this? Why don't we do this? And I agree with you. It would be great if we could do 3D echo in real time in clinical practice. We're also limited by lung interference. Um, and we're also limited by, you know, a lot of these patients have arrhythmia. So 3D echo, you know, it, you can have a lot of stitch, what's known as stitch artifact, where the um, multiple sequences don't merge together because the patient's either going so fast or they're breathing, their body habitus. So, you know, to the other question um, that we got earlier, if there's one thing that we could do to give, you know, a community doctor recommendations that something bad is happening, I would love to figure out what that is. I have a, I have a suspicion that it's, you know, early changes to that internal chamber radius. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely have more work to do. Mm -hmm. 
for sure. But we are going to be giving recommendations in the new guidelines. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Maybe to, to, to the great question, some thoughts. I, I think having it, what Monica said in the report, I think it becomes important to, to have it standardized in a pro. Like there's a lot of times we don't comment on our report about pulmonary flow. It should be a standard to, to have a sentence on pulmonary flow. It could be nice to say if the features are consistent with pulmonary vascular disease, not just RVSP, and have a sentence. I think by having a sentence in a report, people pay attention to it and add it. To, to your question, it's very interesting in the field of imaging that we have going to next point of standardization. Uh, one thing that, that for me was important, once I met the, the director of our lab at, at Stanford, and he showed me a little blue book about standards and the laboratory science medicine and uh, the way all the labs work. And standardization and transferability is one of the key of every clinical lab. And, and we never do that in cardiovascular imaging. So the, what, the way they do it, they have to retest 100 people in their lab, make sure there's transferability of every method. We never get a set of standards of, of, of 50 echo that goes through every sonographers and then people comment on it. I tried to implement it. I think people <laughs> voted me out of the room. <laughs> Nobody wanted to do 30 echoes and then have their values blinded. Uh, the, other, the other question you have is also refocusing on quality. If we want to do 2D, I, having the sonographer, okay, just rotate the RV in different views and show me these acquisitions. So when people review the echo, you know you have angle rotations with the new tools of iRotate or other equivalents that could be easily done. So these small things can improve enormously the quality and give us more consistent remodeling. And the lastly is having tools that, you know, we do so many measures. If you just do, you know, two phases and that tool with two phases gives you your 30 metrics you need. That's simple, that's easy to, to develop by engineering like they do with MRI. So these are, are some, some, some things that could yeah, be Yeah, thank you, but you know, to your point, those are all you know, terrific and I, I agree with you, but trying to convince the Echo guys to look at that, or the, or the sonographers themselves to look at those angles, it's, it's like you're talking to no, a It's very hard, I, I, like I told yeah. you, they, they voted me out of the room when I tried to <laughs> impose it, like three, the only 20 Echoes, so yeah. standardized and have our standardization reporting. But, but you're right, but we have to do it. I think the new guidelines, if they say that it's part of the guidelines and recommendation by society, that usually is very strong to, to push labs to do it. So, so I think that's gonna be important that the, the reports, the same thing, we don't have literacy in our echo reports like radiology has, and that needs to change, like explaining literacy, the findings, and to, to the point we need, when it becomes standard, people will do it. We're making yeah. progress, though. I think only 10 years ago, they yeah. never even mentioned the right ventricle. Yeah, we're making progress. All right, if there are no more questions, we can go ahead and break.